so here we are going to just, just discuss the characteristics of a battery. Now that we have an understanding of what are the different terminologies associated with the battery, we're just going to kind of map it out the, the entire picture. So what different things are and how it can be calculated and so on. So there is a reactivity series, which essentially talk about how much propensity elements have to either go through a reduction reaction or an oxidation reaction. So we need some kind of a standard for that. So the standard reduction potential is zero for hydrogen. So we use that as a standard and uh, everything on top of it, it is considered uh, to have a good reduction potential and uh, everything on the bottom is considered to have a good oxidation potential, actually the opposite. So oxidation and reduction. Theoretically speaking, everything on top of the battery, everything on bottom of the battery, when you combine one of them with one of them from here, that could typically form a cell. Uh, but it's theoretical at best. There are so many complications involved in it, like, you know, compatibility, finding an electrolyte so that it allows transfer between the two. So there are so many different things involved in it. So your lithium goes through an intercalation reaction and all you need is just to find out one on the other side. And as we go on, I'll just show you like, you know, which ones you can pick. As I said, your cell voltage, your open circuit voltage would just depend on the cathode half cell potential and the anode half cell potential. And uh, your Gibbs free reaction that uh, everybody would remember from uh, 11th or 12th grade uh, chemistry. So it's just a measurement of reversible work performed by a system. So any thermodynamic system would have a particular amount of extractable work out of it at constant pressure and constant temperature. So that's what we are referring to here. And N is just the number of ions transferred. F is the Faraday's constant, 96,500 or 96,487 if you're numerical accuracy. Uh, so what I've done here is I've just shown you a demonstration of how you can calculate the theoretical energy density. So this is a uh, Daniel cell. So one of the primitive cells that was created. And there are two half reactions as shown. It, it essentially consists of zinc and zinc sulfate, copper and copper sulfate, and then hydrogen sulfate is just the electric which connects both uh, half cells. And uh, your E0 cell or the cell potential would just be the difference between each of the half potentials. So that's 1.1 volts. And when you do the math, you get about 58.97. So let's say 59 watt hour per mole. And it's negative because uh, it's, it's, it's actually in a galvanic mode right now. So there are two sets, reactants and products. So I've just computed the molecular weights of uh, each of them. And when I compute the theoretical energy density, it's about 262.1 water per kilogram, which means that this is more energy dense than conventional lithium ion batteries, which range between 150 to 250. But unfortunately, that cannot be the case because then this would just take over everything else in the market right now. Uh, so this has to be taken with, with, a, with a pinch of salt because these numbers don't, don't include uh, all the parasitic components which do not contribute to the actual reaction. So there is the beaker in which both of these things are located and then there is a whole trough in which uh, things are located and then there is the hydrogen sulfate which does not contribute to anything. So all of those, those inclusive, uh, the actual value would be about 15 to 20 water per kilogram. So that's quite a difference. Next we're going to talk about the structure of a typical lithium ion battery. So it could be just about any battery, but uh, we're going to be sticking with just lithium ion batteries for now. Uh, so there is a cathode, as I said, positive electrode in the galvanic mode, anode negative electrode in the galvanic mode, and there is the electrolyte and separator combination. So the electrolyte is something that facilitates movement of ions. So ions have to travel through the battery while electrons would travel through the external circuit. Your separator makes sure that your electrons are only traveling through the external circuit while allowing ions through the internal circuit. Um, there's the catholyte and analyte. So essentially you're immersing the whole cell in just electrolyte and the part of the electrolyte, which is seeped into the cathode is called the catholyte and something that is seeped into the anode is called the analyte. You need all of these because your ions would typically jump into the electrolyte, which is present in the interstitial spaces of the cathode and then jump into the, uh, the actual electrolyte pool, move through the separator, do the same thing with the anode and then move to the interstitial space. Um, and uh, of course, because you're getting the electrons out of it, you need the anode and cathode current collectors. They would form the uh, external circuit. So th this would be an electron pool and that would collect the electrons, move it over to the external circuit. And that is why current collectors are being used. So this whole thing is called a stack. So it consists of all of these components. And this is typically in uh, like micrometers. And for to make a cell, you would have a lot of these in parallel. The manufacturing process of this is quite 
precise and uh, tedious as well. So we will discuss that another time. So as we discussed, uh, there are a lot of battery parameters on which the choice of using a particular battery system for a particular application is done. And uh, these are the different parameters. I've shown it for uh, common battery systems that everybody would have seen at some point of time. Uh, so the NICAD system used to be pretty good until the lithium ion uh, system came over and uh, took its place. Nickel metal hydride still being used, very good system, but there are some challenges with it as well. So this just shows uh, the comparison of gravimetric versus volumetric energy densities for different kinds of batteries. Uh, let's just stick to this part of the thing because lithium sulfur is at any point of time right now, just hypothetical. There are some advances being made in that field, but for the most part, it has been touted as a prototypical battery. It's not in commercial uh, supply yet. Right. So all of these batteries are uh, things that you would have been used to at some point. Silver oxide is something that uh, watches earlier old age watches used to have lead acid batteries in vehicles. Nickel ion battery is something that was uh, made as a prototype commercialized at some point, but then it lost its traction because so many other better batteries came by. Your nickel cadmium is uh, something that was really good for some point of time, but of course, uh, other batteries took it over. Nickel metal hydride is still a pretty good battery for uh, specific applications. And lithium ion, as, uh, as is the case with uh, all applications that you see, just leads the way. And uh, the Zebra is actually a funny battery. So it was made in Africa. Like, I don't know, it's just a coincidence, I suppose. Uh, it was actually called Zeolite Battery Research Africa. And it, may, it came to be known as Zero Emission Battery Research Association or something like that. Uh, so it's got the sodium nickel chloride chemistry. Not particularly high voltages, but your overall specific energy density was pretty high for that kind of a chemistry. So the next would be energy versus power density. This is something that we care about because uh, let's say you have high power tools, your drilling tools, for instance, they don't require a lot of energy density because you're going to be using it for like maybe drilling five, six holes at a time. Uh, but then you require a lot of power density because you need to be providing a lot of current to the motor so that you can drill through concrete or metal, for instance. And it's got the comparison of the exact same uh, types of batteries. So this is also for your perusal. Uh, these are the different kinds of cells available in the market. Uh, cylindrical cell has been popularized just because of Tesla. Before that, 18650s were used, but not so much. And uh, there are different standards as well. 21600, I believe. Uh, and there are so many other standards that it's impossible for one person to keep a track of all of them. And there is a prismatic cell and there's a pouch cell. So these also have some typical dimensions, which are fall into specific form factors. Uh, but again, it's like, you know, the A4 or A3 format. And there are so many new formats which, which keep coming out every single day, but it's impossible to keep track of them. And uh, if you are interested, you could go on Wikipedia and type list of battery sizes. I'm sure you would get something. Uh, your button cells are uh, typically used for research purposes and watches and other small wearables. So the reason they make button cells is because if the chemistry goes wrong, there's not much damage you can do with it. So that's why they prefer button cells and coin cells, the other format. Uh, coin cells are not given here uh, because their, their more commercial version is the button cell. So this actually shows uh, the demand for batteries in the last 15 years. So 2005 to 2020, as you can see, it's just increased with time. And uh, when you look at 2005, it's, it's practically nothing because there were no commercial electric vehicles. Even Tesla came in uh, 2007. Right. And uh, these are the different applications that uh, you have for lithium ion batteries. Uh, I mentioned some of them uh, off the top of my head from uh, like, you know, in the first couple of slides, but this is pretty much comprehensive. The next uh, question of interest would be what exactly happens within a lithium ion battery while it is charged or discharged, right? So the cathode anode, as I described, they're just crystalline structures. Um, so the cathode is usually a lithium salt. To be very precise, it is a lithium metal oxide or a lithium metal salt, let's say, right? Or it could be a combination of metals as well. And uh, the anode is carbon. When I say carbon, it's usually the crystalline form, graphite or graphene. Graphene is not commercially usable right now, but uh, graphite is. Uh, and of course, there is diamond as well as an alternative for crystalline structure. But, you know, if uh, they use that, it would be worth a bomb, dead or alive. So we're going to be sticking with a lithium salt and carbon. So these are the two different things, right? So as you would have probably learned in uh, chemistry, you know that there are different crystalline structures. So there is spinal, there is octahedral, rhombohedral, tetragonal, hexagonal, hexahedral. So all of these are different structures. And we just pick and use the ones which we think would fit lithium ions. That's pretty much the concept, right? And uh, think of these for now as bookshelves. So 
this is kind of the vacuum cleaner that moves electrons around and uh, ions around inside the, the chemical cell, right? So the green ones you see are lithium atoms right now. And the lithium atoms dissociate into lithium ions and electrons. So the electrons occupy the, uh, the outer circuit. They flow through the outer circuit. Ions flow through the inner circuit. And uh, this is what happens. So as you keep uh, the external circuit connected, you will find that all of the lithium atoms in the interstitial spaces, they move to the anode. So your lithium salt is essentially acting as the energy provider or lithium atom provider. And uh, your anode, the carbon, which typically contains no lithium whatsoever, would just be filled with uh, lithium atoms at the end of the process, right? Uh, and to answer your question about why bat batteries swell up, the insertion of lithium atoms into carbon is not an easy process. It would actually occupy the interstitial spaces. So the carbon anode actually swells just a bit. It wouldn't account for more than one to 2%, but as the cell degrades, you would actually find that it's, it's quite a bit. And there are some additives like silicon, which are added to car anode, which causes the swelling to increase much further. So the advantage with silicon as an anode is that you can actually support more lithium atoms, which means the overall energy density of the cell increases. But because silicon is very elastic, uh, this means that you would be providing about 18 to 20% cell expansion. And that's not something that's good. So there have been several attempts to um, see if that can be fixed, but it all depends on optimization, like how much of carbon you want versus how much of uh, silicon you want. Right. And um, this just describes uh, a quick process. So as I described, the lithium atom dissociates into electrons and ions and moves into the electrolyte where it forms something called ligands. So your electrolyte is just a lithium salt. Uh, when I say lithium salt, it could be your LiPF6, with, which is uh, lithium hexafluorophosphate or lithium quadrifluoroborate. Uh, one of those. And usually the solvent is a non-aqueous solvent because lithium reacts quite violently with uh, water. So it has to be non-aqueous. And then there is a separator which blocks all electrons, but allows the flow of ions. And then it jumps back into the electrolyte again on the anode side of things where it forms the ligand again. And then it goes through something called the SEI layer. So the SEI layer is formed when the cell starts being used for the first time. So Carbon is not actually as uh, inert as we think it is. So carbon re reacts with the electrolyte to form something called the SEI layer. It's a good thing and a bad thing because if not for the SEI layer, uh, carbon would start dissociating each and every time you use a cell. But um, because of the SEI layer, the overall uh, ionic resistance increases. So that's not a good thing. So it's, it's a boon and a bane. And uh, the SEI is also cause, uh, is something that causes the aging of the cell. So definitely not a good thing, but uh, it does save the carbon for some time. Uh, discharging a cell works pretty much the same way. Uh, it's just a reverse process. And uh, this is what I was talking about when I said the galvanic approach. So the cell has nothing, right? Uh, so it's just a very natural process. So your, your delta G for this reaction or the Gibbs free energy would be negative because it's, it's, a, it's a spontaneous process. I forget what the exact word for that is, but yeah. So as I said, this is just a reversible process. And uh, next question would be, why did we choose lithium ion batteries of all other uh, things? Why lithium ion? Uh, there, there is sodium ion, as we discussed. There is aluminum air batteries. There is uh, nickel air batteries. There is zinc air batteries. But why did we pick lithium out of all the other elements? So going back to 12th grade uh, chemistry again. So the periodic table, lithium is just atomic number three which means that it is one of the lightest metals in the periodic table. And it is the lightest metal in the periodic table, one of the lightest elements in the periodic table. Uh, Size-wise, it is quite big, but doesn't really matter because most of it is space. Uh, so we pick lithium because, you know, Newton's second law, uh, F is equal to MA. We want to be able to move the lightest metal with the smallest force possible. So it doesn't take long to just like push um, ions into another electrode. And the second is highest usable capacity. This is kind of like uh, your nameplate capacity versus usable capacity. So to describe it better, it would be uh, like, you know, what your offer letter says versus what you take home. So if it says one lakh, you would actually be taking only 70,000. So that's pretty much uh, the lead acid battery lithium ion uh, rated capacities. So if a lead acid nameplate says it is 80 kilowatt hour, it means that you could probably use anywhere between 67 and 73 kilowatt hours because there's a lot of losses involved in it. And uh, of course the, the, the performance uh, decreases once you start using the battery. So that renders your usable capacity even lesser, right? And uh, so this is another curve which talks about your uh, depth of discharge. Um, there's something called Pukert's loss, 
which means that for a specific manufacturer specification, uh, let's say the manufacturer has specified 4,000 milliamp hours for your cell phone. If you were to charge it at 4,000 amp or four amps, you'd be able to charge the battery in one hour and you'd be able to use all of the capacity. But if you were to charge it at eight amps, for instance, it's not possible yet, but if you at some point of time were able to charge it at eight amps, you could charge it in half an hour, but you would still be able to use the entire capacity. So that's what this means. And of course, lithium ion batteries uh, provide fast discharge ca capacities. And before you ask, it is not as good as super capacitors, but it's still pretty good. It's, it's the best of the lot. And uh, understandably, lithium has the highest electrochemical potential because it's the most positive of all metals. And uh, as I described, the Puket's losses are very minimal. It's like over a period of time, you start experiencing very, very little. And voltage sag is something that is very important because over the course of the entire period, I mentioned cutoff voltages, remember? So that would start for a fully charged battery about 4.2 volts and stop at 2.5 volts. And in between, so this right here would be 4.2 volts and the numbers are different. Don't mind the numbers in this table right now in this graph. So it starts at uh, 4.2 and ends at about 2.5. And you will find that most of it, the usable capacity is pretty much flat. And you want that to be flat because you don't want it to change with your uh, state of charge. So that's what the voltage sag means. And it's got a very, very high storage, uh, energy storage density as well. And uh, this is easily just the best in the market right now, if you don't compare lithium, lithium polymer. Uh, but if you were to compare this with gasoline or diesel, for instance, so gasoline or diesel would be about 12.8 to 13 water per kilogram, 12.8 thousand. So which is 12,800 water per kilogram, which is like incredibly high, which is why your uh, entire energy capacity or entire range for your uh, IC engine cannot be compensated with just battery. So we'll have to go like, you know, disruptive at this point. I'm just going to skip this because this is just basic uh, derived from the Avogadro number and uh, resistance temperature changes. Uh, so, so this is very relative. So when I talk about uh, resistance to temperature changes, it means that your lithium ion battery is actually more capable of resisting temperature changes than any other competitors, let's say, right? Uh, but of course, this is in a very reasonable range. If you end up like reducing it to minus 10 degrees, it will still cause the, uh, the battery's uh, capacity to fade. And if you take it above a particular temperature, it will also start like aging faster. Of course, like the lead acid battery, it doesn't have any orientation issues. The lead acid battery does have its own problems, but the sealed lead acid battery kind of fixed it. But again, it cannot be entirely inverted. For instance, it cannot be used up, upside down because uh, that would just cause the battery uh, liquid to either leak or the reaction to happen inaccurately. And uh, this is the main point, no maintenance required. So lithium ion batteries have absolutely no maintenance requirement. Thank you.